This is Star Talk Sports Edition, and this is going to be Cosmic Query's grab bag, but a particular kind of grab bag because we're going to think about sports not only on Earth but off world. Ooh. And of course, I've got with me my co host, Chuck Nice. Chuck. Hey, Neil, what's happening? All off right, world. our professional stand up comedian who's actually in pretty good physical shape, even though you never really did any sports in your life. Is that correct? I mean, I, I have played sports in my life. I just don't talk about the disaster that it was. <laughs> okay. That's all. There it is. Okay. That, that's honest. I'm okay. honest. <laughs> and I've got Gary O'Reilly, former soccer pro from the UK. Gary, my I co-host. Know. All right, dudes. Well, so this kind of subject is fun because mm. it involves sort of the – physics of sports as played in different sort of gravitational atmospheric environments. And while I can take you some of the way there, when you really want to do it right, we got to go for our geek in chief. And there's only one person with that title in this sector of the universe, perhaps the entire universe, perhaps the multiverse itself. Charles Liu. Charles, Woo! welcome back to Star Talk. I don't, I'm not worthy. Thank oh, you, no. It's such Man. a pleasure to be back. Thank you. Thank Man, you, you know, I, we have to bring you back with enough frequency so that I don't get big headed about my own geek expertise, <laughs> right? Because after a while, I say, yeah, I got this. I got this. And then you put you in the same room with me. And it's like, no, I don't got this. <laughs> I got this. It's We're in this. We are all in this together, Neil. You have your expertise. I have mine. No, the we continuum. It's all good. You you come in from beyond the horizon of the continuum that I occupy. Let me just say it that way. How's that? Uh, yeah. I I do not know if I agree, but thank you for your kindness. It is always a pleasure to be here and talking about science and sports and literally everything else. Well, uh, every everything. And Great to see uh, Charles you. is a, a friend and colleague, and he's a. Uh, professor of Physics and Astronomy at uh, City University of New York on Staten Island. And some people don't know that he was with me 20 years ago when we were building and finishing the new Hayden Planetarium in Rose Center. So he, Yeah, I he, was six at that time. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, was, I was being his, squeezed into the corners to make sure that children couldn't get stuck in various he, spaces. Isn't Charles Liu the young Sheldon of the Hayden Planetarium? The young Sheldon, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we got you, Charles, here. And yes. so, but just what, could you just... Uh, you know, we've got questions from Patreon, which has been our, yeah. our, our sole source. So if you want to mm -hmm. get questions on Cosmic Queries, you can join Patreon for a very low entry level. I mean, we want you to, you know, go a little higher, but entry level gets you, gets you at least this far on it. And so, Charles, you have just an overarching thoughts about sports on Earth versus what might be necessary on other planets, if we were a multi-planet species, for example. Oh, yeah. The basic point is that all human motion is fundamentally pushing against gravity. Everything we do, whether we're walking or we're standing or we're jumping or anything like that, trying to hit a baseball, trying to keep it off the ground, everything is based on gravity when it comes right back down to it. So in the end, if you're in an environment where there is no gravity or microgravity, then your own personal forces take over those activities. Suddenly your physiology matters way more. Suddenly the environment in which you are playing, the size, the shape, the speed, all the different things matter. It's gonna change sports fundamentally, no matter where we go in the universe, as long as it's not 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration. Wow, so finally mm -hmm. we can play Quidditch in outer space. <laughs> <laughs> Except that, you know, if you get hit by a bludger, uh, you don't fall. Right. Where are you going to go? Right. So oh, that that's right. Because too. if, yeah, mm -hmm. I forgot about that because they, even though they're flying around, they're still magically, if they fall off, they fall to the ground. And that, that's that, right. that hurts. They're still, they're still, gravity, gravity, in, still, gravity dominates is still in play. The play field. All mm -hmm. Right. However, if you are playing jetpack Quidditch and, <laughs> and your broom has its own propulsion, so um, as in rockets, right? When you do get hit, you'll be knocked off course. You have to correct in order to come back. So, yeah, but you, you won't, be, but you won't fall to the ground. That's right. No, there you go. Well, what's yeah. the fun in it if you don't hit the ground? 
Because <laughs> as a spectator, I haven't come to see you do quite nicely. I've come to see you go splat. <laughs> Gary, did you just say what is the fun of Quidditch in outer space? <laughs> no, well, yes, without without the floor to land to smash without, into without falling. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, so Charles, the mm-hmm. the so maybe we're, we're thinking we're too narrow in our thinking. Yes. Maybe the sports that we have honed on Earth were conceived in a sort of a 1G environment. Maybe yes. if we go to the moon at, at, at one-sixth gravity or, or, or Mars at, at 40%, gra- 38% gravity, maybe we should say, what sports would, can we invent sports that would be best served by those gravitational fields and not try to port mm. something from Earth to these other locations? I agree with you completely. Whole new nice. kinds of sports, uh, and I thought I have an argument. You just, you're just agreeing with me, Charles. You just agree. Completely agree with you. <laughs> okay. Well, on Mars, I know it will be mutant badminton, where your little mutant, like Quato, is the only one actually allowed to hold the racket. So, so the little mutant growing out of your chest. I got you. There it is. I thought the mutant comes out and does a slow, soft shoe. <laughs> well, yeah, but he'd have to use your feet. That's oh. the problem. Oh yeah. no, not again! Yeah. So, so that's that's a good way to think about it. Now, so who's got the questions, Chuck? Do you have the questions from Patreon? Both Gary and I, I have. Oh, questions you both do. From Patreon. Yeah. Okay, I mean, so who goes I'll, first? I'll jump in. I'll jump in. Okay. William, okay. one of our Patreon patrons. Uh, what elements or considerations would be important for an outer space sport? So we're going to drill a bit deeper into what we've just discussed. He says, I'm guessing it's a he, William, I would love to see an Enders game style arena, but what would really be entertaining to watch people compete at in space? So we've got, again, the entertainment. I need someone to hit the floor. I need entertaining. I so need when he says space, he, means, he, he implies zero G, I think, when he's saying in space, right? I think it's, exactly. and, it's that so and. Without the net to save you or no yeah. net to not save you, where is the, where is the risk factor that we all are going to watch someone defy the risk because due to their expertise. Hmm. Right. Um, the, for those people who aren't familiar with Ender's Game, that was a, a novel written by Orson Scott Card a number of decades ago, where to fight an alien menace, a number of children were put into a place called the Battle School. And they were out in space and trying to figure out all kinds of new strategies and methods that the adults put them in. Uh, and it was a little creepy of a book, actually. Um, you but think? nevertheless... <laughs> Uh, it, I, I, it, Chuck, I knew that. I, I knew everything you just said. I knew that. Yeah. And, and so... <laughs> Neil, your nose you has grown by about six inches. <laughs> no, of course you do. Uh, but but the it was very interesting. Orson Scott Card did a good job trying to imagine what fighting and combat would be like in Zero-G in a number of those cases. It was later made into a movie with various mm. CGI effects and things like that. I don't know that they did as well as, as we would have liked them to, but, you know... They, well, what would be the, fun in a boxing match, if I hit you, mm-hmm. we both you recoil backwards. from that yeah. contact. That's right. Mm-hmm. right. Uh, so, so what we're probably going to be talking about, my guess is that you're, you're going to be thinking much more about... Uh, evade and capture type games as opposed to retrieving an object type games. Mm -hmm. So football, soccer, baseball, and those kinds of things. You hit a ball, it's going to go everywhere. It's going to, you know, you just have to go get it. And then there's no air messing with it. The spin will be hard to work with. Um, Rather, it'll be like, can you grab that person that's going from point A to point B uh, before the person gets there? Uh, There's probably going to be issues of musculature. Uh, are you going to bounce off a corner? Now, how big is the space going to be? Can you change your position? And then the equipment will matter so much too. Just as Chuck was saying earlier about jetpacks, right? Uh, if you can't, if as soon as you launch yourself up, in the same way that a basketball player leaving the floor knows where uh, you're coming down, you're going to have to launch yourself and know where you're going to be headed, unless you put some sort of energy or force. Uh, behind where you're working and what you're doing. So it's going to be much more physics-based. Well, it's not only that, Charles. I mean, on Earth, we can move forward or in any direction we choose because there's friction between us and some other surface that enables that. But um, in space, any time you want to change direction, 
you have to give up some mass in order to do that, right? That's you right. can't just That's choose right. to change direction. Something has to has to has to come out of you so that you recoil in the opposite way with your momentum, and that's the only way you can change direction. Uh, I thought you meant you had to pray in order to change direction. <laughs> Just give up some oh, mass. mass give up some mass. <laughs> okay. that, that may well be involved. I'm that could still thinking, happen. That could yeah. still be. Yeah, it's so a gymnastics, open. Charles. Gymnastics. Yeah. I mean, what's the point? If, if I do a triple somersault, I could do 30 somersaults, and I'll just that's keep right. going. And so you gymnastics will no longer until exist in zero gravity. Right. Sorry. So, I'm not a gymnastics so, hater, I'm just saying. Well, here's what you would do then, right? You create a circumstance where you have to leave one surface. Maybe you're pushed off of one surface, and before you reach the other surface, then you have to do all your per things. The other thing that you could do, though, is you could have magnetized gravity boots. Mm -hmm. So from surface to surface, you know, uh, the magnet is turned off on one, you push off, and then as you go, then it's turned on the other, and it's, that's when it pulls you in sticks, so. Right. So, yeah, so like space, space Pradas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, wait, so we'll, if, we'll it's, if, if, if it's a magnetic stick, then you always stick the landing, because you will connect to the magnet. If it's electromagnets that they just turn on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but that could be cool, too, for wrestling. So, Neil, think yeah. of it like this. Well, I'm asking. I shouldn't say think of it this way because I've never wrestled anybody except my own demons. Um, <laughs> Stand strong, Chuck. <laughs> but, okay, let's say you're wrestling, mm -hmm. right? So you're on the platform and you have certain points of your body that have magnetized uh, like, uh, like knee pads, elbow mm -hmm. pads, mm -hmm. and your shoes, okay? So while you're wrestling, these are turned on, okay? The, the floor is magnetized. You guys are actually wrestling. But at any point, they can turn it off. Maybe it's yes. on a cycle, so it'll be, so it'll be very uh, fair to everybody. You've it's on do a it. cycle. Or it's so random. Do it random. You've got to do it random. Or random, or yeah. random right? Random. So now, how does that change you as a wrestler? Because isn't, lef isn't leverage everything? Right. And at some points you're going to be floating. And then what move do you have to think of while you're floating so that when the cycle starts again, you're in a better position to dominate yeah. your opponent? It's a magnetic strategies or what that is all about. Very cool. Yeah. I, I like that. I, yeah. I like that. Damn. All right. Well, this whole segment is just about sports and space. So let's keep going. Who's got the next question? All right. Uh, I guess I'll bring up the next one. This is mm -hmm. from Fitz Fritz Menzel. Hey, Neil, if there were a zero gravity sport that involved athletes launching or jumping from one wall of a huge arena to the other, what speed Ooh. could they reach? What would happen when they hit the other wall? <laughs> <laughs> so, Charles, what's, tell me about the okay. symmetries of jumping oh, and landing wow. in that uh, context. Let's, let's do the quick calculation, okay? D equals one half A T squared. Uh -huh. The typical athlete can probably jump about what? Two, two meters in the air, five, six feet, if they're really, really accomplished. Uh, so if you get your center of a mass six feet in the air, that's that's pretty good, right? Yeah, but so, uh, but but they're working against a, gravity. If we're just going to yeah. put yourself into motion, no, what you don't I'm have, that's not is, the right calculation, right. I don't no, think. No, no, what I'm trying to do is to figure out how much force and acceleration a typical athlete can create by pushing off. If we're talking about pushing off on Okay, Earth, so then you right? get a direct measurement. Okay, yes, right, there you go. Yes, direct measurement. So, so uh, uh, 2 equals 1 half GT uh -huh. squared, so that's 5, 2 fifths, 0. 0.4. What's the square root of 0. 0.4? Um, so 0. 0.4 is 0. Yeah, it's about uh, 0. 0.6, right? Yeah. And a little bit between 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.7. 0. 0.7, uh -huh. So you're going for uh, 0. 0.6 seconds deceleration at 10 meters per second. That means you're, you're able to launch yourself at approximately 6 tenths uh, of of gravity, right? Six tenths of a meter per second, something like that. Okay. Uh, six meters per second. All right. So you can go, so you're going six meters per second, and let's say you weigh about 100 kilograms, 220 pounds, something like that. So that's. Um, okay, what, but the thing is, if I can jump, if I can, second, if I can propel square. myself at that speed, yep. I will arrive at the far wall at that very same speed. That's right. right. So oh, no, I'm trying to figure out how much damage you would do to your face. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the the answer is well, I mean, we can do the math specifically, but let's let's just do it intuitively. If I jump at full speed into a wall, 
Mm -hmm. right? Or if I, let's say I jump as hard as I can and I'm in a room that's only uh, three inches higher than my head. Think about the, the impact that I would feel on my head when I hit it. Right, especially right. if you're if you're face up when that happens. Yeah, yeah. basically right. that's the end of your face. That's oh. right. So it's a lot. I mean, you it can is. really cause yourself serious damage. No question about it. Right. So what you'd have to do is while you were floating from one surface that you just jumped from to the other, you'd have to somehow turn around right. so that you so landed that on your feet, feet and then you use your entire musculoskeletal system to absorb, to absorb the, the landing. Absorber. Right. It's right, right. a shock absorber. Exactly. Mm -hmm. wow. So basically you would have our do. sports in zero G will be performed by cats. <laughs> Is that what or we're saying? highly padded humans? Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. That's All right, funny. give me another one. What else okay. you got? All right, um, okay. Matthew Ritter, I've heard that due to Titan's thick atmosphere and low gravity, that human powered flight would be possible. We'd Ooh. also be Superman. Ooh, Charles, I had not heard of that. Is it is that what's the thickness of Titan's atmosphere? Do you remember? Uh, it's a little bit more than Earth's atmosphere, actually. But but if it's only a little bit more, uh, yeah, one point something or two point something. Earth okay, so it's not something. like Venus where it's a hundred times yeah, our atmosphere. No. It's it's of uh, order Earth's atmosphere. Okay, so where do you gain most going to holding aside the fact that you'll get vaporized on Venus, mm -hmm. uh, ignoring that complication, is the atmosphere thick enough for you to gain lift just by your own? Uh, strength, or do you have to go to the lower gravity, because Venus has Earth gravity, or do you have to go to the lower gravity of Titan and take advantage of that fact against the slightly higher uh, density atmosphere? Um, I would go with, I would go to Titan. Uh, the the, the advantage, because you realize that Venus's atmosphere is so thick that it's like being down half a mile in Earth's oceans. Mm. to be at the wow. surface of Venus, right? Mm -hmm. So right. even mm -hmm. our best nuclear submarines have a hard time surviving at that level. Okay. So even uh. if you can build an airplane, you could be crushed like an egg anyway, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. much better off in a moderate atmospheric period, uh, area where and so you if, can if actually to survive. Fly in a, let's just say, for instance, uh, we're somehow adapted to the pressure, right? Mm -hmm. If you have an atmosphere that thick, do you still need the same aerodynamic uh, lift and everything to fly? Or would you be just resting on the actual, like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the actual atmosphere itself? No, it's no, like to, to, to your point, Chuck, it is possible for the atmosphere to be so thick right. that you don't have yeah. to fly because you're just floating in it. You're that's that's floating. your point. Yeah, that's my point. It's like, it would be like being in the middle of the ocean. The, it's ocean, like, the water is, yeah. I, yeah, I don't have to fly in the ocean. I just float in the ocean. Well, there's a difference between density and pressure in that okay. kind of environment, right? So if something can have high pressure but relatively low density, although there is a relationship, as we all know, the, the so-called ideal gas law, right? PV equals NRT. So there is a direct relationship between, well, there's a relationship. I don't want to say direct necessarily because that's mathematically uh, specific. But all these different factors come into account. It is possible for something like a, a balloon to float in Venus or on Venus in its atmosphere, right? And in that case, if you were floating on the atmosphere, you would rather be above the cloud tops of Venus than above the cloud tops of Titan because then you would have more buoyancy because of the, the, the pressure, the atmospheric pressure that you get. No, but, but how about just my own strength to fly just by, you know, put on some wing looking right. appendages, right? Like, uh, like, like like all those old 1918 films where they show all, guys trying to jump all, off of all a cliff. Those, <laughs> all those guys, right? Yeah. Okay. If they were on a different planet with a thicker atmosphere, mm -hmm. I bet some of them would have flown away. They probably would have. Some of them might have been successful. But again, the only problem is that everything else has to be adapted accordingly, right? If your wings get crushed and shredded because of the pressure, before you even get down there, uh, that's going to be a very Icarus-like situation. Yeah, so but in the opposite I, direction. I just, I'm just picturing a guy falling from a cliff, flapping his arms, going, <laughs> "If only I had been on Venus." Uh -huh. <laughs> you really yeah. think those were his last words, Chuck? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably, "Oh shit!" <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got to take a quick break. When we come back, more. Star Talk Sports Edition Cosmic Queries. Kind of a grab bag, but it's about it's about it's about athletics in space. And but when we come back, let's talk about sort of more exotic things here on Earth on Star Talk. 
We're back. Star Talk, Cosmic Queries, Sports Edition. And we're just talking about sports in space and on Earth and all the ways that the laws of physics dictate what you can and cannot accomplish. And I've got with me Chuck, Chuck Nice, hey, man. and Gary O'Reilly. I know. And I got my uh, resident geek in chief, Charles Liu, who's yes. got his own sort of fan base within the Star Talk fan base. No, I mean, well, without the a people, doubt. The to- there are people who are all into Chuck, Chuck Liu, yes. Charles Liu. Charles, right. I, 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 sorry, if I say Chuck, I really probably mean Chuck Nice, but occasionally a Chuck slips out when I'm talking to you, Charles. So yes, just, I know. I just, know. I mean, my Twitter handle is at Chuck Liu for a that's reason. That's right. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, so, so let's keep going. We've got, uh, these are Patreon members, ex- sort of exclusive <laughs> questions that they get to ask. So uh, who, who's up next? This is Violetta, your number one fan. She's an astrophysics fan and she's a sports fan. She's, she's asking about the two main types of muscles, fast twitch, slow twitch. Fast mm-hmm. twitch are good for quick bursts of energy like sprinting and slow twitch are good for endurance sports. Supposedly, people genetically have one or the other. So which one would be better for space travel? Also, and this is the kicker, P.S. I'm the fast twitch type. I can sprint from home to first base like you wouldn't believe. So Whoa. I, just, I love yeah, it. Yeah, actually, most, most baseball players are primarily fast twitch types. Yeah. Because you, you have to be ready to move at any given time and then move explosively when the opportunity happens. So if mm. I remember correctly, Violetta is indeed a, an excellent baseball player. So I'm not at all surprised about that. And I think, twitch. Charles, there's a, there's, you do get a combination. But yes. then, then the majority is one or the other. Yes, and that allows every you muscle. To, yeah, every muscle has a mixture. And in fact, uh, the slow and fast twitch, uh, the fast twitch muscles, so called themselves, are actually divided into two kinds as well. The type one we call the slow oxidative, mm-hmm. and then the th- type two. There's a two A fiber, which is a fast oxidative and glycolytic uh, fiber, and then there's yeah. a two X, which is just fast glycolytic fiber. So. Um, the what does all that mean? Of, what, like, uh, oh. I, so does that mean I can run? <laughs> you tell me the fast twitch fibers have slow twitch fibers in them? Uh, no, each muscle has a number of fibers in it, and I the combination you. of fast and slow, the mixture of those uh, two, that's got right, it. is is yeah. where you wind up with your particular brand of fast right. twitchness and slow twitch. And for people also, who have yeah. an equal amount, they just sit around and do nothing. Because <laughs> they can't do <laughs> They're like, I can't go <laughs> fast, <laughs> I can't go slow. I'm just on the couch. <laughs> now I have to eat potato chips. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the perfect both. mixture is good for the thumb on the remote control, right? It's no, just, no, uh, no, there you no. go. You, what the actually uh, the so folks like who do triathlons, right? right. Um, they are, of course, are, are slow twitch supposedly because everything is an endurance sport. Mm. But I could imagine a sport in space someday where you combine slow and fast, where you have to do both kinds of things, like run the equivalent of some sort of marathon and then quickly sprint a hundred yards or something, and, and, and then, then shoot yeah. a gun. And yeah. then throw oh, a discus. Well, that's, yeah, okay. that's a that's yeah. biathlon. That's a, that's, well, a that's, tr- uh, that's decathlon. But, uh, but I mean, we right. have we have those sort of sports right now. If you think about basketball, if you think about soccer, they're explosive, oh, but they're over an extended length of time, and you, mm-hmm. you don't get breaks. So we kind of have a combination of that sort of thing. So yeah, it's uh, yeah. So lucky for Violetta. Wait, Charles, we always any anytime anyone has portrayed people in space, mm-hmm. everything is kind of in slow motion. Slow motion. Yeah, right? Yeah, 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 and you need that yeah, Strauss yeah. waltz to carry uh-huh, you through uh-huh. that. There is right. no fast twitching going on in space. Well, so what's up with that? Or is that just well, our our how we imagined it? The the re, again, because we don't have to push against gravity, we don't have to sustain any muscular activity. Right, you produce a burst of impulse, um, and then everything and flows out of that. Oh, right, so right. you feel like you're not doing anything. So right. the answer to Violetta's question specifically is, and and Violetta, one of these days, please tell us how whether we should pronounce it Violetta or Violetta, because you know it, it matters, um, and we want to get it right. Good point. The right. answer to your question, Violetta, is that because everything matters as far as fast twitch. Uh, and the impulse, and then what you do with that impulse after you stop the impulse. Fast twitch people are definitely better at space sports than slow twitch people. That would be my guess. But the thing and, is- and just to be clear, just to, to highlight what Charles just said, 
right? And and Gary, here's just something interesting to know. Mm. In soccer, you can explosively go from like zero to sort of high speed. Yep. In space, you just have to do that once at the beginning and you just float the rest of the way at that same speed. Whereas you're always overcoming the fact that you're slowing down yeah. because you're, there's yeah. friction between you and the road. And you need to change and, the direction and, and, and all and, the other things. The change direction is another sort of point of acceleration. Char Charles, tell us about acceleration going from zero to some speed that you didn't have before and acceleration changing direction. Just put that on the, on the table here for us. Well, when you are speeding up, right? acceleration or slowing down deceleration, physicists normally just call deceleration negative acceleration. So you're just moving back and forth depending on that. Now, when you are going from no speed to a new speed, right, uh, that is actually a quick burst of energy. And what you're doing is you're changing your net momentum. So you're exerting a certain amount of acceleration over a certain amount of time. And, and force times time right, is what we call impulse. It's a version of momentum. And so when you're trying to accelerate from zero to something, it's how fast you can exert the force and for, you know, how long a period of time that determines how fast you get to when you get to the zero to the whatever. And I'm fast. Mm, I tell you I'm fast. <laughs> I, turn out the, I turn out the lights and I'm in the bed before the room get dark. <laughs> you float like a butterfly and sting like a bee too? Ah, <laughs> rumble, young man, rumble. <laughs> Wait, but Charles, I wanted you to talk about what it means for acceleration to also refer to a change in your direction. Oh, that's true. Um, when you're going around in a circle, for example, you could be going at the same speed, but because you're changing direction every moment, you are uh, changing, you are experiencing an acceleration. Uh, we physicists, as you know, Neil, uh, think of acceleration as a change both in how fast you're going and what direction you're going. Right. And so as a result, you have to take both of these things into account. If you're out in space, you kick off, you're in one direction, and unless you can push yourself or kick off in some other direction, uh, you're going to stay in the same direction moving Forever. in that straight line right. yeah, until you are acted upon by some force. Something else. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's where you well, have to lose the mass that we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you, or mm -hmm. get help from something bigger that has mass. Like, right? Isn't that, well, yeah. isn't that what you guys uh, call a Gravitational flybys, for gravitational, example. Exactly, right. Yeah, yeah, You'd have to yeah. come really close to a planet or something and come at just the right velocity and... You know, you have to move the speed and direction such that you don't get captured by the object, but then right. you can borrow. It's like planetary billiards. <laughs> that would be Do a three cushion. Oh, yeah. Speaking yeah. of a new sport, a gravity yes. assist. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. what I'm talking about. See, what size? Cool. What size would you? What? How small could you make objects like that, and and then have that sport? Would it have to be planets? Whoa. Well, you, you kind of need really large amounts okay. of mass, right? Mm -hmm. So you might need like white dwarf star or neutron star material. Damn. That well, that's, are yeah, encapsulated. Well. And that would allow you to produce enough gravitational effect within, say, the space of a typical football pitch or something. That's like crazy. That. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, how about this then? Back to magnets. How about you have like a game like billiards where the idea is to... Uh, transfer energy by colliding the balls so that they actually end up hitting a magnetic pole and that's how you sink it into the pocket. Instead of a pocket, it's the pole and you have to, uh, would that work? Or would it be something like if you hit it on the wrong angle, like it would just go off forever and you'd be like, look at that, I lost another <laughs> ball. <laughs> well, well, yeah. uh, ma electromagnetic force follows the inverse square law, just like gravity does. So it is mathematically appropriate if you use magnetism or some sort of electrostatic repulsion or something like that to mimic the behavior of what gravity would do to us here on Earth. That would be perfectly acceptable. The cool. challenge is that here on Earth, because we're all on the surface of the planet, right. we all experience the same gravitational acceleration to very, very uh, nearly identical amounts. Mm -hmm. So whether I'm at the uh, end zone or whether I'm at midfield, I'm still experiencing 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration. If you're using electromagnetic stuff, as soon as you move some distance, you're gonna wind up feeling a difference in the amount of force because your source is so concentrated. 
compared with the earth, which is so broad compared to our football or, or our sports arenas, shall we say. Mm. Cool. Mm. Interesting. Mm. All right. Uh, well, give me some more questions. All right. This one is from Roman Prukup. And Roman says, hey, Gary, do mm -hmm. you think it's possible to improve the shooting speed by engineering materials on football shoes similar to how we have improved shooting strength with hockey sticks? Are you sad you didn't experience these impacts of science in your active career? Mm. Well, mm. In other words, bro, are you, are you sad you're old? <laughs> you're, you're, you're old fart. Yeah, yeah. It's like, bro, you're like too old to have technology in your sports. So, yeah. like, <laughs> that's all we had leather helmets, you know. <laughs> See, I, I don't think we can get a, a kick point in a boot like you have in a hockey stick and an ice hockey stick. But, and, but although that just increases the speed and the power immensely, what I could imagine is something that we've discussed from time to time and why. It, Major League Baseball doesn't have aluminum bats. Yeah. I said it for you uh, because the exit velocity is so, so fast. But if you put something that's lightweight and strong, maybe like aluminum or a ceramic plate in, in, the, in a kicking position on the foot, maybe you could in prove the exit velocity off the, off the wait boot. charles oh, charles would you, you break your instep <laughs> break yeah. you break someone's shins if you miss the ball exactly. wait, well, it's wait, not wait, Char yeah uh, Char charles let me ask you if yeah. is is gary right here do you want your shoe to be more rigid or do you want it to have some kind of a springy textured skin mm -hmm. so that there's like a double sort of springiness to when your foot makes contact with the ball which of it those would be on, better? It depends on whether you want force or control. Yes. Right. Speed or control. Uh, this is true for any material. If you have a longer contact time, mm -hmm. you can impart to it more force, right? Because the maximum amount of force that you can produce per given unit of time, uh, you multiply that by more time, you wind up with more net force or impulse, okay. as we were talking mm -hmm. about going mm -hmm. out, right? But the problem is the longer the contact happens, the more the ball and your foot have to interact with one another, thus creating sort of micro forces or directional changes that are beyond your control, things that are not mathematically uh, predictable. So the instant and your foot touches the ball is not the instant the ball leaves your foot. That's right. So you'd have to recalibrate so what that, all of that would mean. Right. Ooh. Yeah, what it would mean in, in soccer specifically is that you wouldn't want to pass off of that because if you passed off of that part of your shoe, then you don't know as well where the ball is going to go. But if you were shooting with that part of the shoe, that would be to your favor because it'd be like kicking the ball on the valve and the mm. keeper would not have any idea where the yeah, ball is going because going. there's so, so you get much ball sort of yeah. yeah. But when so you're I think that's passing you to up. your friends, you end yeah. up just screwing up. Damn it, Ronaldo! <laughs> How many times are you going to do that? So they, they did. They pay you all this money to get the ball to the opponent. <laughs> so they Damn did Chuck. some years ago. Adidas brought out a, a, a range of boots, cleats called the Predator, and it had these rubberized areas on on certain parts of the boot that would allow for more contact, as you just described, Charles, mm. and therefore allowed for accuracy. Now, you can't change your footwear. That sounds the like game. cheating to me. Wow, well, there you go. No, that sounds like it, there's less yeah. there's less slippage between yeah, foot yeah. and gripping the ball. So, the ball. It's so like gripping get, the ball, right. So if right, you get grip really on the ball, I can now rotate that ball better. Mm -hmm. So imagine yeah. a, imagine table tennis bats with stippling nice. on one yeah. side. That yeah, we call them paddles here. This is America, <laughs> Jack. Okay. <laughs> the word bat is for base freaking ball, okay? <laughs> Or cricket. Table tennis. Or cricket. Or cricket. Someone got out of the wrong side of bed, didn't they? <laughs> this is America, Jack. <laughs> we sent you back on the next boat. <laughs> oh, I don't even get a plane, I get a boat. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. The Olympics are starting soon, Neil. You can't do that. I can't do that. All right. I just have uh, to get my America chops going. Uh, All right, let's get, let's get another question. We've got a couple of minutes left in this segment before we get to like the philosophy of it all in our third segment. Uh, so, right, let's, let's find another question. Who's next here? All right, Eric Varga. You've mentioned previously in a tweet a few years ago is where you said a winning overtime field goal was likely enabled by a third of an inch deflection to the right caused by the Earth's rotation. 
The Coriolis, Coriolis effect. Thank you very much. So paying attention in class. I was wondering, and this is interesting, is there an ideal directional orientation for football stadiums? And could that be given could that could take full advantage of this effect from Earth's rotation? Eric, so when you. I when I did that calculation, I didn't trust my answer. Mm-hmm. And I sent Charles Liu an email and I said, Charles, I want to post this. Did I do this right? All right, this is this is the double checking that happens always in science. If you get a result that like no one had thought about before, or is it a little weird? Maybe you didn't do it right. Did you carry the two? And so Charles gave me the Charles Liu seal of approval. I <laughs> went with the number. I made the assumption. It wasn't an assumption. It was true for that stadium that the stadium was oriented precisely north south. And so my sense was that you get maximal Coriolis deflection. Uh, if you did that, but then Charles, you told me that it doesn't have to be north south. It could. I don't see how you get a Coriolis circulation if it's east west. It depends on how far directly east west. If you're exactly east west, then you're not going to get a deflection from that particular the the east west rotation of the Earth, right? Yeah. But it's all a matter of where you are. The problem is when you kick a ball, right? You're not always kicking it directly exactly even there is wind involved oh yeah of course no no all, all other, other things, things being equal right. all right. i all said was mm-hmm. th- that the rotation of the earth influenced the path of the ball all other Correct. things being equal and it only yes. matters because the ball hit the freaking upright yeah. and you have a yeah. round ball hitting a cylindrical pole fractions of an inch as any baseball player knows can make a big difference in the in the in the in the resulting reflected that's right. direction that's right so, no, you're completely correct that going due north-south, perpendicular, the closer to perpendicular you are to the rotation of your frame, the more of the Coriolis effect there you go. the okay. object will experience. So, so the answer to this to is exactly north-south. Put all, sta- if you, if, <laughs> put all stadiums d- d- exactly north-south. Exactly north-south. <laughs> right. And then try not to ever kick to the right side of the center. Because then the Coriolis force takes you out of the game rather than into the game. All right. So but does it matter which direction on the field you're kicking? So no, each direction south, it deflects oh, to the okay. right. Right. It, it, it Thank you. Deflects, interestingly, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, you want to put all your sorry in the northern hemisphere. The equator too. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, yeah. The, in the northern right. hemisphere, it'll always deflect, deflect to the right. And the yep. equator, there's no, you, you got nothing. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you're in the southern hemisphere, everything deflects. deflects I'm, just the other gonna, way. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say any GM picking a kicker based on this. <laughs> hey. may, not, may not be too good at his job. <laughs> yeah, maybe. We, we got a I lot mean, of sabermetric type things going on in sports these days, right? They're, they're trying to parse, exactly. you know, yeah. tiny percentages. I can uh, tell you this if your ball bounced off the upright and went left and not score versus in and do score and that and and a big game was on the line there you're going to be wishing you had the laws of physics in your favor from the Coriolis there you go. Mm-hmm. true and so isn't true. sabermetrics all about the tiniest little things that can yep. influence the probabilities of what's happening yeah that's right and the statistics of them trying to squeeze knowledge about the sport activity from the numbers and the data. That Just from the data. From yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. A whole other thing. We've got to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll try to think philosophically about all of the science that's going on in sports. And there's a question that I think I saw there about spitting on your hand when they want to throw the, the, the baseball. And yeah. wouldn't that give you less grip rather than more grip? I want to make sure I'll to lead off with that when we come back on Star Talk Sports Edition. Right. Grab bag, the physics of sports on Earth and in space. We're back, Star Talk Sports Edition. Cosmic grab bag, but it's really physics of sports on Earth and in space. I got Charles Luke. Charles, you're tweeting at Chuck Nice. I'm sorry. Yes. Wow. Really well, no wonder start- my sorry, no wonder I'm having a problem with Twitter. <laughs> at Chuck Liu. Yes. At Chuck C H U C K L I U. L I U. Okay. So I hope I didn't uh, nope. disappoint people who asked Chuck Nice questions. <laughs> no, Chuck Nice can answer my questions just as well as I can. Is no uh, yeah. oh. <laughs> Now that was the funniest thing you've ever said. <laughs> so uh, Chuck Liu, L I U, and uh, Chuck Nice comic. 
Thank we you, got sir. you on Twitter there, yeah. That's yeah. Right. And my three left feet. Yes. Does it have the my in there? My three left feet. Yes. Okay, so I assume you're right footed, so this means you're you're clumsy. It's like a dig on your own coordination, yeah. is that right? It, totally. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you're not you're not saying that secretly you're another species, right? Of human. <laughs> no, right? Okay. I, I I have never been that clever. Okay. We, we got questions that are more philosophical this segment, but I want to go back. Uh, someone had asked a question about uh, spitballs, I think. So who who, who carried that? Which okay. one of you? Okay, uh, let me jump in here. Uh, Richard it. L. Sanders. Uh, why does a baseball player spitting on his hands improve his grip? Oh, his hands, not, not yeah. just a pitcher. Okay. Instead of lessen his friction. Thank you. Big fan of the show. Well, you're welcome, Richard. Hope this is the answer you're looking for. Yeah, Charles, this is a mystery to me. It's always been a mystery. Plus, plus, why would you want to hawk a Louie on your palm? Yeah. Oh. Right. There, there is a difference here. We're conflating two things, I believe. One is the spitball, right? Mm -hmm. Which is where you're spitting, you're pitching, you're spitting on the ball, you're trying to get it as wet as possible. Yeah. So when you throw it, then it winds up with weird aerodynamics and the person who hitting it has a hard time hitting it. That's a spitball. So it, That's, it winds yeah. up with aerodynamics that not even the pitcher can predict. That's so right. nobody That's knows right. what it's doing yeah. at that yeah. point. Yeah, it's okay. like a knuckleball on steroids. Right? Okay. That's the first thing. So That's now outlawed. The last person thought to have ever thrown a spitball in legal competition was Satchel Paige because he was grandfathered in and allowed to pitch it until he retired. Mm. But... And the maybe idea. nobody wanted to hit that ball because it was No, nasty. they did not. No, no, no. <laughs> Man, no. Yeah. 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 Did you just gross. spit on that ball? Ew. <laughs> All but right. The, the idea of spitting on your hands is very similar to... Wait, wait, wait. And, and Chuck, Chuck. <laughs> and there they are invoking the grandfather clause on black people once again. This once is again. Right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but this harsh. time it helped them out. Okay, fine. Right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Satchel yeah. Paige from the yeah. Negro Leagues then who That's made right. it into the That's majors. Right. Yeah. For... One of the great pitchers of all time. Yeah. Um, now, uh, the, the reason people spit in their hands to grip a ball is yeah. a completely different thing. That's more akin to someone getting a paper towel damp before wiping a table of crumbs. The idea mm. of a little bit of moisture increasing the ability to connect has to do with static electricity, right? The, the reason dust clings to a wall, for example, is static electricity. And, and if it's dry and has enough static there, then you can't get the friction necessary to grab the ball. It's a surface effect. So you're not trying to coat the ball and coat your hands with fluid so that they're slippery, but instead you're adding that little extra bit of moisture that gets the dry stuff off of the ball and your hand so that you can grip it better and thus be able to throw it and oh. catch it more effectively. Okay, now how about That's was it uh, about. was it Poppy? Who's the one who spit into his hands when he had hitting gloves on? That that <laughs> it's like, uh, dude. <laughs> These are like soft leather gloves. Now you're spitting uh -huh. on that on top of that. What what mm. what are you doing? I I do not know that one. I think Big Poppy did that. Big Poppy. Yeah. Wow. Big Poppy. Well, if you, you're talking about. And uh, in all fairness, uh, he just hated those gloves. <laughs> <laughs> my my guess there is that maybe there was a a mental process where if you I don't know have you ever like know the difference between wet leather and dry leather. They they slide differently. Yeah, right? they do. Yeah. Actually, you know, so, now that you well, say maybe, that, wet yeah. leather yeah. grips wet. better. Exactly. Yeah. Charles, it's really true. If, you, if yeah. you're trying to open a can of something and you have like a, a, a dish towel, it's way more effective if it's slightly damp than if it's completely dry. That's right. So I think maybe that's that's what uh, was Man. going on there. Right? Okay. Um, All right. So All even right. on leather, a little yeah. bit of moisture can make a difference in the grip. Here's the problem with Big Poppy spitting into the gloves. He hits a home run and then wants to high five me around the bases. Ew. No. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> well, you you got to have your you got to have your wet wipe ready, right? Here you go. Here you go. <laughs> and sanitation, sanity wipe, san sanitation. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. You get an elbow, big boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, let's go on with some of these philosophical questions. What do we have there? Who's next? Uh, right, here we go. Sam Couch. Will there ever be a point when humans reach a fastest possible time? In other words, will there ever be a point in sports where no more world records could be set because humans have reached the lowest possible and wait till turnover page time, assuming you can finish a race in zero seconds? When that happens, how will time sports progress? 
So what, will we keep diminishing time for the 100 meters, the 1500 meters? Any Until it's done course? in zero seconds? Is that, <laughs> is that the yeah. question? That may, I think, Until I think, Usain Bolt <laughs> finishes this right. race yeah. he's there in the, the instant day, the, the day before he started it? <laughs> yeah, he's there before he left. Um, I, I just think it's that point where are we capable of diminishing our world records substantially anymore? Well, let me, I'll lead off with this, but I want to hear Charles's response. Mm. You know, you remember the Banneker Mile, right? This is, when, when was this, 80 years ago Roger or so? Banister. Roger Banister. Roger Banister. I'm sorry, Banister, Banister, the Banister, Banister Mile, yeah. where there's, no one will ever run a four-minute mile, or, or beat a four-minute mile, and they're talking about the physiology and everyone, because no one was doing it. And so the urge to think you've hit some limit, I think, is very strong within us. Yet, that has never seemed to be the case in reality. So, Charles, what's your reflection on the limits of world records? I do believe that it's possible we are reaching some sort of asymptotic limit, right? Where at, there is some point beyond which we simply cannot exceed. However, I don't know what that limit is. We humans, uh, I think the Roger Bannister example is excellent. There are other uh, limits that supposedly humans could never get to. As and well. by the way, when if I remember correctly, when he finished the mile in under four minutes, didn't he bring two other people with him under four minutes? Mm. Uh, I don't know if that happened in that one race, but mm. within uh, a year, many other people had broken the four minute mile. Yeah, because 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 the, so, the mystique was gone. was gone. That's right. That's Whoa. right. So we've got so the same thing with the two hour marathon now, haven't we? Is it Kip Koji? Surprisingly enough, Kenyan runner. Um, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, um, they seem to own the marathon these days. Uh, yeah, that, to break right. two hours for a marathon, that, that, I mean, that, that was basically the holy grail, but that seems, it's not official yet because it's not mm -hmm. being done in a race or with sanctioned shoes, but uh, it seems like it's doable, as it were. Right. So we could get to a limit someday, but mm. I am not going to make a prediction as to what that limit is in any sport. And Gary has made sure that a lot of our sh programs, our sports edition shows, have focused on improving human athletic performance, but not just who's going to work out harder, but it's what kind of technologies are brought to mm -hmm. bear, what yeah. kind of nutrition, what kind of maintenance of your physioskeletal system that you are maintaining. So uh, it could be that we have to start going in these other directions. It's not just, I, it's not I, just psychological and it's not just who's working harder. And I think if we ever do reach a limit, like it's at just a, a tap out point, then what we'll do is turn to uh, augmentation. Yes. So that we can break it and then they'll accept that. Da, da, well, how about this? As long as it's hey, in this? the rules. As long as it's okay. within the rules. No, then we change the rules. Charles, here, here's what I thought about this when I saw swimming records getting broken with such frequency. And I said to myself, this can't keep happening at, at this rate. And then I realized how you do this. Okay, this is how you do it. So swimming used to be timed to a tenth of a second. All right, now it's to a hundredth of a second. So maybe future world records, you need to track a thousandth of a second. And then world records beyond that, a ten thousandth of a second. And we'd all be celebrating, oh, you beat him by three ten thousandths of a second, whereas that was not even measurable decades ago by the, by the stopwatches that were used. Mm. And so you can still set world records, but you'll do it asymptotically. It's you're approaching whatever that limit is. We don't know what it is, but each next increment is littler than the previous one. What do you yeah. think of that, Charles? That may happen someday. It just hasn't yet. Uh, we, well, we, we, we are, are measuring we, swimming we are in hundredth of a second. Swimming. Yes, but the records are still being broken by approximately the same increments. Oh, was that right? right? I didn't check yeah. that. Okay. Uh, we could break them asymptotically if we're actually reaching the asymptote, but we're not there yet. We just oh, Okay, I got it. Going to your point, Chuck... If we had ligament replacement, but rather than Gary, not, sh sh the man who's yeah. been injured more than all of us is always talking about wanting no, to be the so, bionic man. No, no, it's not. But you see, you're not going in there to repair damaged ligaments. You're going in there to get stronger ligaments. Therefore, you're able to put more muscle in there. You're able to generate more power if that is what you need to do. And therefore, you may be able to enhance your performance. And this... I don't know if that is within the regulations or whether that would seem like a body doping. Mm. 
Yeah. I said full body prosthetic. What's that arm <laughs> still doing here? <laughs> Gary just Gary went RoboCop. On he totally movie. he totally he went all RoboCop. <laughs> <laughs> that was a line in RoboCop. Lose the arm. Lose the we arm. We thought we could keep. We could, no. Lose the arm. That was. I like, said full body prosthetic. Lose the arm. <laughs> yeah, that's the bad guy said that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Super cool. Okay. All right, give me some more. Give, I, right. I, we blew a lot of time on that one, quite, but it was an important yeah. point of philosophy there. All right, here's, what else do we have there? Here's one for Gary. Hunter mm. Q-Tone says, yo, yo, keep it hot. This one is for Gary the man. In international football, how come the United States fails to produce high-level male soccer players? Our women consistently prove themselves and compete to the best. How come we are having trouble creating a USA World Cup team of men that can achieve what the women have already achieved? NBA has international programs. Does this have anything to do with producing great players? Gary, why do American men suck at this? Okay, and, and that's yet, just it. They pay more than the women. Yeah, yeah well, Is that's, still the that, case? That, that, but yes. That's a conversation okay. for another time. Otherwise, we yeah. will be on this podcast for the next six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, the U.S. men's national team are producing, this country is producing a lot of talent. And it's not just average. You've got players now in not just the big leagues in Europe, but the biggest clubs. You have Weston McKinney, who's playing in one of Italy's top clubs, Juventus. You oh, you're saying Americans are going abroad. The, our top Americans are competing abroad. That's what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, because they So want, why can't we gather, why can't we staple them all back together here and do. then have a national team? You do, you bring them together for the national team events. But at the moment you've got players, uh, you've got Rainer, young guy, so talented. He's a, Dortmund in Germany. You've got Christian Pulisic, who's in Chelsea in London. You have got all sorts of US players out there. And when they bring them back, they bring back an extra level of knowledge. It, it goes through the coaching staff. And this is a process that's maybe a bit slower than Hunter wants. But I can tell you now, it is gaining momentum. Really, it's gaining. So, really so we have singularly really good players, but we don't have the depth yet to sustain that as in with an interleague, with, with league quite. play. Yeah, I mean, you've got one player, Jorginho Dest, who is playing in the first team at Barcelona alongside Lionel Messi. You're getting there. It's just maybe okay. not as quick as some people want. All right. There All you right. go. You we stay out of America. You'll make it happen. <laughs> Eventually. <Okay>. Eventually. <laughs> Guys, we got to call it quits there. Right. Charles, give me, give me some final reflection here to send us out. Okay. We've been talking a lot about performance enhancement. Right. And also in the previous segment, Chuck was talking about feeling about cheating. And I think it's important for us in this overall philosophical idea to, to realize that we often use the term performance enhancement to euphemize cheating. You could enhance your performance all you want, as long as it's within the rules, both the spirit and the letter. But the moment you're actually going outside the rules, then that's just cheating. We shouldn't call it performance enhancing. So some, let's say somebody is caught for right. a performance enhancing drug. Just say they used an unallowed drug, they cheated. And that's the kind of philosophical idea, the, the difference, I think, Gary, between the performance enhancement mm. and Chuck, what you were talking about in terms of cheating. So that, I go to the gym, I'm um, performance enhancing. I swap out my Achilles tendon with, with carbon nanotubes right. <laughs> and, yeah. I'm, and I'm cheating. And, and so, you're cheating, right. Yeah. Unless the rules allow it. If the rules right. allow it, then fine, go for it. But if you don't, don't try to tell me, oh, it's just performance enhancement. No, tell me whether it's cheating, it's cheating. or not cheating. It, or that's not all, cheating. That's my take. Chuck, Char Charles, you you said it right. And <laughs> I don't think, I think that's unassailable. Mm -hmm. uh, wisdom, you. insight, and advice to oh. us all. Well, hey. Uh, thank you for having me. It's always such a pleasure to sit. Here always and chat good. We got to get you more. I miss you. We got to get you oh, more miss back you too. on here. All right, all right, guys. We got to call it quits there. Chuck, nice. Goodbye, goodbye to you. Thanks. Then Gary O'Reilly, and as always, uh, Charles Liu, our resident geek geeks. Bertice, expert. <laughs> uh, I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. As always, keep looking up. 